the sound of the Talandon, which we just heard, comes to wake up the thousands of monks in Mount Athos to begin their glorification of God from the wee hours of the morning. In the same way, the voice of the Yeranda Ephraim has come to wake up thousands of souls in our days from their deep sleep and spiritual sloth. Yeranda Ephraim is the abbot of our convent of Prophet Elijah in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, and the spiritual father of many monasteries and convents in Greece. He's a pure joy and a blessing of the Lord for us, and his words are full of God's wisdom. And now, after the blessing of the Yeranda, we will attempt to translate one of Father Fram's sermons on the one thing that's necessary. From the sacred and holy gospel, we all know about Lazarus who died for four days. Lazarus had two sisters, Martha and Maria, Mary, and at some point they invited the Lord to their home to show their hospitality, and our Lord came to their home to be with them. Martha was very anxious and concerned about getting everything ready for the table. But Mary, the other sister, sat at Jesus' feet and was listening to the holy teachings of our Lord. Jesus, to make Martha wiser so she would not be overly anxious about the daily chores, told her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Martha had wanted Mary's help and asked Jesus to allow her to get up from his feet and help with the table. And it was at that point that Jesus told Martha that, Martha, one thing is needed, and your daily cares should be kept at a minimum, up to a point. This advice of Christ is valid for all of us, so our concern about our daily needs to be held to a minimum as much as we need, not more than what is necessary for our mere existence. Only one thing is necessary is what has meaning. The sentence, only one thing is needed, according to Christ's teachings, is to have all our attention and focus on how to be liked by God. The concern for the salvation of our soul, the concern for our immortal and eternal soul. Martha was more interested and concerned to please the Lord with material goods, but Mary, somewhat wise and mature, thought this is a great opportunity. This is an opportunity to listen to the holy teachings. Who knows how long we'll have the Lord on earth? And she sat at his feet, and the Lord said that this blessing would not be taken away from her because she wanted to pay attention to the word of the Lord. To the words of God. She chose to be overjoyed by the teachings and wisdom of the Lord. And for us, even though the need for the daily necessities is unavoidable, we have to have these things in this life. We cannot exist without provision, without food, material goods, because we are material as much as spiritual. Our body has the need for food once again, clothing, etc. But above all, our immortal soul has the need for the only one thing that's truly needed. The need, the complete concern on how to wash and purify our soul and to put it in the house of God to avoid condemnation and hell because as we very well know, the salvation of our soul is not a game. We cannot play games with everlasting life because we are mortal. We are temporary refugees and immigrants, and we're simply being shown some hospitality here on earth, and someday each one of us will say goodbye to this life, and we will meet our Maker. Each one of us will go back to our beginning, our origin, and our beginning is to return the breath of God where it came from. The Bible says, the Lord God formed men out of the clay of the ground and blew into the nostrils of the dead body of men 
and man became a living soul. The living being of man is the breath of God. And as breath of God, it must return where it came from. That's why we feel emptiness in our soul when we don't have God's comfort and grace. That is why the soul does not find rest in anything. All the material and worldly things are foreign to its nature. However, when a man's soul dwells in the house of God through prayer and Christian life, then the soul becomes fulfilled, secure, and feels the presence of God within. For this reason, the game of everlasting life should not be played so cheaply and nonchalantly, because in a few moments we can leave this life. We will positively face eternity again if we happen to leave this life in a few seconds. It is not a game. Let's not think that it's a game to face death and to face the wicked demons. To face directly our spiritual report card. Every man has somewhat of a report card from God. How can we look at our report card when we discover that all our sins are numbered with extreme accuracy? Especially since having this sinfulness, we don't realize it and we avoid to do anything about it. Is it a game to face our ascension towards our judge, to face the demons? How are we going to look our Lord in the eyes? Do we have the strength? Does our conscience give us courage, strength, and confidence? Of course not. And I am the first. We cannot look our Lord in the eyes. We will lower our eyes from our shame because we did not do the will of God. The white and pure garment that we received at holy baptism, we darken. Did we wash our holy garment? Did we wash it with tears, tears of repentance? True repentance, that is. Did we change our life? Did we live with purity? Not at all. When we think we accomplish something, we fall again into the same pit. This is exactly why we must concentrate with all our inner strength on this one thing that is needed. We must work always on how to wash our heart, clean our mind and body, save our conscience from the invisible chains of sin, and at that time, by God's grace, we will reach the one thing that's necessary. That's when through death we will pay us towards heaven, towards paradise, and of course, at the second coming of Christ, we will be awarded the heavenly kingdom. Heaven, the kingdom of God, is wide open. From the exact time that Christ delivered his spirit on the cross, with his last breath, paradise was made wide open. Up to that point, the entrance of paradise and the entrance of heaven was closed. Christ, by opening his immaculate hands, by stretching his arms on the cross, he embraced the entire human race. He's the only one who so loved mankind, even till death, death by a cross. But, unfortunately, we don't love him, of which I am the first, because if we loved him, we would not sin says the Bible. We forget about him, but he never forgets about us. He's always visiting us, sometimes with a sickness, sometimes with a disease, trials, tribulations. It's him, Christ, who's knocking. He's knocking on the door of each one of us, and he's telling us to open the door so he can come in. And he says, when I am inside, I will make you happy. However, we padlock our door and fail to understand that Jesus wants our salvation. That's why we must get things straight. We must wake up. We must use all our inner strength and check the serious subject of our salvation. Our soul is eternal. I can leave this world in seconds. What happens then? 
judgment. Judgment follows, and after judgment, a simple decision. The decision will be one way or the other, either light or darkness, either with God forever or with the devil and the demons forever, paradise or hell, within minutes. Now we're alive, we're well. But if something happens to us, we will be facing these circumstances instantly. That's final. There's absolutely nothing that can alter the course of these events. It's all guaranteed. We will watch all these things unfold in front of us, death and judgment, whether we like it or not. How much do we overlook this reality? We sin, we ignore and forget our prayers. We forget and disobey the commandments of God. We refuse to change our life and our conscience. We do this in full knowledge that in a few minutes, a person can die. A man can pass from this life to the next. And all that he has created on earth, be it wealth or family or degrees, titles, fame, where are all these things? How can these things help him then? When death comes, they all vanish. Man is disillusioned. The devil, the ancient serpent, presents him with a screen with different accomplishments and he gets hooked. But Father Time, under his feet, passes him by with days and nights acting like earthworms excavating his ground. He gets consumed by the daily affairs while losing ground under his feet. Days and night, the, the clock is ticking. Days and nights fly by and having no ground to stand on someday when this person is totally fascinated by all that this life can offer him and all his possessions and creations and accomplishments, all of a sudden, his whole world suddenly crumbles like a house made out of straw cards. And at that time, he panics. What am I doing? How did I fall? How, how can this be happening? But to no avail. That's why we must think twice, and very seriously, I might add, and to tell ourselves, my soul is eternal. I am a sensible human being. Someday I will die. I will be judged, on, and the decision will be forever. Again, this can happen instantly. What must I do? Well, we must do what God wants, to change our life, to repent and stop sinning. This is what we must do, to start repenting, to go to confession, to cry for our sins, and try to follow a new path true path, the true path, full of light, positive, and to put the blinders on and look straight to heaven. And if death comes, we will not panic. David says in one of the Psalms, I prepared myself and I did not get upset. I did not get disturbed. When a person is ready, he does not panic. When somebody is prepared, there's nothing to worry about. Who panics? the person who's totally unprepared. At that point, a person that's not prepared will think, well, what should I do now? How can I straighten myself out quickly? But it's too late. It is too late, just like in the cases of a sinner who took no time to think about God. And when his life came to its final moments and reached the sunset, he instantly started to call out for God with his last breath. And his angel told him, When the sun was high in the sky, where were you playing at? Now that the sun has set, now you thought of God? All those years, where were you? This incident concerns all of us when we don't care for God and our soul. Let's not play games with these matters because the consequences are extremely serious. 
Now let's say now that a person has taken some steps for this holy care of his soul who wants to repent and live with God. Are you going to see this person at the nightclubs and dance parties? Are you going to find this person worrying about many things? Of course not. You will see him careful, wise, considerate, to be aware of every possible way he can sin and try to avoid it. You will see him careful about everything, very wise and serious. But from our works, including myself, it seems how little we concern ourselves about this one thing that's necessary. From our deeds, we show how much we believe in God, how much we believe in the eternity of our soul and the kingdom of God. Do we realize that we may have scandalized people with our careless life? Did we ever confess that by wanting to dress sexy and cute, it is likely that we may have scandalized some immortal souls? Probably never. Did we ever confess that we could do a good deed, but we decided not to and spend our money somewhere else? Probably not. This is also a sin. We must therefore take serious measures because we do not know what tomorrow can bring. If tomorrow we happen to find ourselves in the courtroom of God, we will be beating our heads against the wall with no chance for forgiveness and correction. We are blessed by God that we're still alive, we're still breathing. We are not dead. We have not left this life. We have the right to repent. We have the freedom to change our life, to correct ourselves, and our past can be totally changed. We can purify ourselves to live a bright and a new life. This depends on us. We have not left this life, and this is truly God's blessing. We must thank God that we're still breathing and every breath can be a word of repentance to change now and not tomorrow. Because again, we do not know what tomorrow will bring. In the Bible, the Word of God says, if you can do something good today, do it, because tomorrow you may not be able to. This is why we must take care of our immortal soul, the only thing that's really needed to correct ourselves and not lose ourselves here and there to take care because we know very well that the demons, the evil spirits, which provoke us and push us to sin, at the same time, they watch our falls and they record our sins with details of time, fact, and person. They record everything with extreme accuracy. This is not imaginary. This is not a lie. It is the plain truth that we indeed face the dreadful death. This is the truth that we will all meet death, and certainly this is not a game. I don't know if you have seen a man dying, and many times with signs, we have seen how people cry out, how they see angels, they see demons. The Archangel Michael who beheads the man with a sword, he beheads him spiritually. How the eyes turn inside and out, and how in many instances the poor human being swallows the bitter cup. All these references of death and about death that we see in the tradition of the church are very, very true. The church fathers are telling us the truth that for every human being, especially the Christians, these facts will follow. We have learned a lot. We have seen many deaths and we can verify these things with the blood of our heart that this is the truth. This is the reality of our life. That's why before this dreadful moment comes, before death comes, before we see the demons encircling our deathbed, 
trying to grab our soul and take it to hell, that's when the kind angels, our big brothers, these holy creatures are very busy and they try to save our soul from the hands of the demons. So great is the love of our holy brothers and that of our guardian angel. Therefore, we must plead with our guardian angel to guard our soul. We must pray to our guardian angel to always help us, to always help us because when we pray, he's also praying with us. When we're sinning, he is crying. He stays inactive. And I will give you a very nice example from the history of the Holy Fathers. One holy man, a, a saint, a ascetic, was coming down to the city to see the bishop for some matters concerning the monastery. And when he got outside of the city, he saw a young man crying bitterly. He sensed from his gift of vision, and when the eyes of his soul were open, he recognized that the person crying was not a man, but an angel of God. He went to him and told him, In the name of the Lord, tell me, who are you? And the angel said, I'm not a man, servant of God. I'm an angel. And I'm a guardian angel for this soul. And this soul is inside this home now and is committing adultery. And I'm sitting out here weeping because I cannot go inside in that filth. I cannot go inside because the stench there, and I'm praying to God to make him see the light, to repent and stop living in sin. The angel is crying, and the man having an immortal soul sells that soul for a plate of lentil soup according to the scriptures. That's why all of us, and I myself, we must think seriously and not be fooled by the evil and sin, especially at a time when we have need for repentance and mourn for tears. Let's not run here and there constantly to dances and parties where we jump and make ourselves up to be different than how God created us. Let's come to our senses and get busy to see how we can be liked by God. God sees how we are inside and not outside. The devil and sin sees our outside, but God watches the inside. Let's start concentrating on the beauty of our soul with virtues and not on the outside appearance, thus making ourselves much different from the natural beauty that God gave us and therefore destroying our soul and transforming it. The more we try to make ourselves up on the outside for all things, we will be judged by God because nothing goes unnoticed. We make a mistake and God's computer records our responsibility. However, when a man repents, God's computer erases our debt. For God, this is automatic. For the Spirit of God, this is not difficult since He's everywhere. Therefore, even the slightest thought of each man is perfectly recorded. And the thoughts of all of the billions of people, God can record instantly and God can calculate the amount of the debt for each person. Now that we still have time, we still have the ability to take care of this debt. We are still able to breathe and walk, and death did not follow. So let's change. First of all, I must change, and then you can follow. And altogether, correcting ourselves, we must know that we will achieve everlasting life. And do you know what that means? Next to be next to God, it is inconceivable. So much wealth, so much joy, that the mind of men cannot grasp it. People who went to heaven and returned told us so much. But the 
best witness comes from a most holy man, Paul the Apostle. St. Paul was taken to the third heaven, and having returned, he said, the human mind cannot perceive, cannot understand the treasures that God has prepared for us. Eye has not seen, and ear has not heard these things. Man's mind has not conceived, and his heart cannot understand, cannot feel all the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Man was created for this everlasting life, and this life awaits mankind. Therefore, it is worth it. The troubles and sufferings of this age are worthless compared to the future glory that will be revealed to the children of God. Every man that will be saved will be a child of God and will inherit the kingdom of God and be God, God's heir. God does not want payment from men, does not want repayment for his grace. Millions of sins, billions of sins, for God they are nothing, they are zero. What is a handful of sand in the ocean? All the sins of humanity are but a little microbe in the vast ocean. Therefore, the sins of one man amount to practically nothing. That's how easily God forgives men as long as he returns through true repentance. We must return in the arms of our God the Father. When the child returns in the arms of God the Father, it is all over. There is no sin that can beat God's great mercy. And since we have so much inexhaustible compassion in front of us, why do we hesitate to run in the arms of the Father and become forgiven? The devil is holding us back. God and our guardian angel is pushing us forward. So who are we going to listen to? Whoever we show obedience, that's where we will go. These are the words of God. These are the things that the Holy Gospel teaches and the Holy Fathers. Let's not disregard and ignore these words. Let's not be consumed by the daily affairs. Christ said it very clearly. Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. So let's keep minimizing our daily cares and let's dedicate ourselves on how to cultivate our soul and to present it fruitful in front of God. And sure enough, death will come, whether we like it or not. We will all sooner or later enter the channel of death and we will reach the dark gate and we will go through. There's no other way or path or opening to slide through. We will all pass and follow that route. Let's realize that, that we are 100% convinced that each one of us will die and we will pass to his judgment seat. Today, when a man is to be judged and the charges are serious, we all know that this person goes through many paths and troubles in order to defend and save himself from jail and even death. He finds attorneys. He makes sure to find the best attorney. He wants to, he looks for a person that has clout and he looks to pay anything to anybody that would be able to help him in this very difficult predicament. He looks for witnesses which will enable himself, enable him to be saved and to have the verdict come out and find him innocent. So much concern for a temporary case, so much trouble, but for God's judgment, which inevitably awaits all of us, 
where the game of eternal life will take place, we are totally neglectful and ignorant. Our negligence is proven by the lifestyle that we lead. Our deeds also prove at which level we have developed our spirituality and our subject of our eternal life. May God's grace and help be sent to give us the light and strength and grace to become worthy of this holy subject which will successfully lead us to enter in the paradise of God and to avoid condemnation. Because hell and Hades is something seriously dreadful, very dreadful. Hell is not in the conscience. Some people would like to underestimate the seriousness of hell by saying that say, uh, hell is only in the conscience. Hell, according to the church fathers, is spiritual. Spiritual paradise and spiritual hell. The existence of the soul is spiritual, and so is the existence of the demon spiritual. Christ will say at his second coming, Go out, go away from me, you evildoers. Go in everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. So is hell in the conscience? No, because the demons are not bothered by their conscience. They don't suffer. So the demons celebrate in their sins and crimes against God. When they don't sin, that's when they feel hell. They are not bothered even though they are conscious of their deeds. Unlike people, and for that reason, hell was prepared for them eternally. And that's where they will go. At the second, time of our, second coming of our Lord, the demons will be sent to hell along with those people that share in the deeds of the demons and the devil. Therefore, hell is positive and spiritual, and it's darkness and fire, a devouring warm, and so forth. As we read in the book of the elders, St. Macarius the Great, the great ascetic of the desert was walking around in the desert and at some point he ran across a human skull and he tapped it with his cane and said, who were you when you were living in the world? And a sound came from the skull and said, I was a priest of the idols and you are Makarios, the holy man of God who prays for the whole world and your prayers, Holy One of God, reach even us, the idolaters. And how does my prayer benefit you, asked Saint Macarius. The benefit is that very small, a very small trace of light reaches us, and one person in Hades can see the person next to him. And to us, this is some kind of consolation. And the saint was terrified to hear that it was a consolation for someone to see his neighbor even slightly. And he tapped again the skull with his cane and walked away sad. The tradition of the fathers and the ascetics has so much wealth and examples concerning hell and its spiritual reality along with the reality of paradise. These are opposites in the same nature of eternity and spirituality. It is not a matter of my conscience burning me and eating my sides like a parasite and covering me with darkness for the transgressions that I have done against God. No, along with our conscience, we will also have the spiritual hell. The church fathers spoke and dogmatically placed the existence of paradise and hell at the spiritual level. Because people today, 
And some theologians even explain that hell exists in the conscience of a person and so on. Again, these people underestimate and confuse and negate the beneficial thought and reality of hell, and they are talking about conscience. Very well then, I can choke and kill my conscience, play ignorant, and I escape hell. No, it doesn't work that way. The demons are sent to hell because the devil does not feel anything in his conscience. The devil celebrates in his transgressions against God and does not suffer. Man suffer, suffers when he sins against God because he has a soul and a conscience. He is the breath of God and suffers. The devil, on the other hand, celebrates. Consequently, hell is necessary for him, not in the conscience, but in the positive existence. For this reason, people that are found unrepented at the time of death are sent there. And since we have the truth at hand of hell and paradise, it is up to us to avoid hell and not go down there. Hell is no place for a man's soul. No, the breath of God must return in the arms of God. And there it will live forever with a heavenly father. But the man who rebelled and transgressed with no remorse, that's where he will go, for he is a child of the devil. For this reason, we Christians should get busy, repent, and let's shed some tears and return not tomorrow, return now again in the arms of God. Because again tomorrow may bring us grief. How many people sleep and never wake up? How many people die in the highways and other automobile accidents? Within seconds, where one may be singing, he gets hit head on and dies instantly. And with a song on his lips enters the judgment seat of God. That's what man is all about. Man's heart works like a clock. At some point, the ticking element stops, the spring breaks down, and that's how the heart of a human being works. When the heartbeat stops, it's all over. Such is men. That's why the scriptures say every man is a liar, not because a man likes to lie, but the big lie is that he tries to look great and important, and in a split second, he drops dead. We have nothing under our total control. We have no power over our wife or our children or our wealth or our health, absolutely nothing. All things are unstable. They all hang by a thread, by a piece of hair, because we can lose it all from death, and again, that can happen in seconds. When death comes, do you know where you will go? No. Do you know the way? No. So let God guide you where you will go, since God will lead you, make sure you make things right with God. Because if you don't get right with God, someone else will lead you. And that someone else will lead you in the terror of Hades. And there, men will come to his senses. But what's the use then? He will be unable to correct himself. Now, today, this minute he can. Man must turn his heart towards God and tell him, My God, I sin against you and against heaven and I'm not worthy to be called your son, but please make me one of your servants and return straight in the arms of the Father. And once God will wash us, clean us, and dress us with his grace and gives us the fatted calf, he will lead us in the banquet of the church, he will give us his body and blood, and we will become one with Christ. And once we become one with Christ, the devil will have no jurisdiction over us. This is the gospel truth. No one can contradict with this truth 
of our Orthodox Church. Again, I repeat that we must wish in our prayers to God to grant us repentance and a return and a good ending. And the end of our life, to be Christian, peaceful, blameless, painless, and of good defense before the righteous judge. In closing, I pray that God will make all of us worthy of his repentance and his kingdom. And may his grace enable us to meet again and pray for each other in the spirit. And if someone departs from this life, I pray that he meets God forever. Amen.